Welcome to the Center for Energy Education's third video in our series on energy storage. My name is Jason Bone, Photovoltaics Instructor for Halifax Community College. I also do frequent classes and discussions located at the Center for Energy Education. Interested in learning more about solar, such as system design or installation? Please reach out to me at Halifax Community College or right here at the Center for Energy Education. Today's discussion will be on renewable or sustainable energy sources. The reality is there is a finite supply of fossil fuels as the time frame required to make these fuels is on a timeline much greater than that of human life. Add to that the effect burning these fossil fuels has on our environment and the urgency becomes evident. Maybe we have enough fossil fuels to last our lifetime. But what about your children and their children? How will these future generations look back at us if we do nothing to secure their future energy needs or their environment? Water, wind, and the sun can provide us with the energy we need and do it in a way that is friendly to our environment. In fact, as we will find, it is actually the sun that is responsible for the water cycle as well as the wind we use to generate electrical energy. These energy sources will be our topic of discussion today. Let's begin our discussion looking back at the pie chart we examined in our first video. As for renewables, we can see that hydropower makes up the largest percentage of electrical energy generation globally. With efficiencies around 90 percent, hydropower is the most efficient way to generate electricity. The power generated produces no atmospheric emissions, making it a clean energy source. Since hydropower relies on rivers, it's also a secure source for energy as it is not subject to disruption from foreign suppliers, cost fluctuations in fuels due to markets, international political crisis, or transportation disruptions. It's a great base load and peak load supplier of energy as generation can be ramped up or down by adjusting the amount of water flowing through the system, a critical component for all power grid stability. Let's examine the water cycle and see how the sun is responsible for its two major components, condensation and evaporation. The sun heats the surface of the water causing water to evaporate, ending up in the atmosphere as water vapor. As it rises, it cools, becoming clouds, which eventually condense into water droplets, creating precipitation, returning the water to the earth, creating rivers and groundwater. Here we see a basic hydropower plant. The plant is comprised of several main parts. The reservoir, the dam, the intake gate, the pin stock, the turbine, the generator, and the transformer. It is the dam that creates the reservoir or lake by stopping the natural flow of water from a river. This reservoir is actually stored energy, like a huge battery. This battery can be turned on by opening the intake gate, allowing water to flow down the pin stock to the turbine where the kinetic energy of the moving water creates the mechanical energy which causes the turbine to rotate. The turbine is mechanically coupled to the shaft of the electrical generator causing it to spin, transforming the potential energy in the reservoir to electrical energy. The voltage output of the generator is stepped up to a higher voltage and sent to the power grid. Wind power shares many of the same advantages of hydropower. The power generated produces no atmospheric emissions, making it a clean energy source. Wind is also a secure source for energy as it is not subject to disruptions from foreign suppliers, cost fluctuations in fuels due to markets, international political crisis, or transportation disruptions. Unlike hydropower, the wind can be intermittent or fluctuate. Turbines will not operate if wind speeds are too high or too low, making some locations more desirable than others and increasing the need for energy storage. To be worthwhile, wind speeds averaging 25 kilometers per hour 
or 7 meters per second are desired. Here we see a wind resource map from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. This particular map shows the average wind speeds 30 feet above the surface. This next map shows the wind resources from 180 foot above the surface. And here we see a map showing the wind speeds at 360 feet above the surface. As you can see, the higher we build the turbines, the more wind resources they have available and the more energy they can produce. In our discussion on hydropower, we talked about the importance of the sun's role in the water cycle. As we examine wind, note how once again the sun is in control, making wind power an indirect form of solar energy. Have you ever wondered why it's always windy at the beach? During the day, the sun warms the Earth's surface, which radiates heat and warms the air. This warm air, which weighs less than cold air, rises. Cooler, denser air moves in and replaces the rising warm air. This movement of air is what creates wind. At night, the Earth's surface cools and this process reverses. At its simplest form, all a wind turbine is, is a large propeller coupled to a generator. As the wind blows, its kinetic energy causes the turbine blades to begin to rotate, transforming the wind's kinetic energy into mechanical energy. Through a gearbox, the turbine is connected to a generator. As the generator spins, it produces electricity, which is sent to the power grid. Every method of generating electricity we have discussed so far, coal, natural gas, hydro, wind, all had one thing in common. They turned a generator and used the properties of electromagnetic induction to create electricity, as I demonstrated in our last video. As we venture into photovoltaics, this will no longer be the case. In the solar industry, the term solar is typically used to denote a system that uses the heat from the sun to generate energy. What most people refer to as solar modules don't use the heat from the sun at all. These systems use the light or photons from the sun, hence their name, photovoltaics, or simply PV. These systems produce no emissions and are silent in operation. Like wind, PV systems provide decentralized power, increasing security of supply nationally as customers don't have to share supply or rely on relatively few large remote power stations. This also helps prevent losses in long transmission lines by having energy sources closer to their point of use. The majority of photovoltaic cells are made of silicon, the second most abundant element on Earth. This silicon is doped with boron, creating p-type material, which is an acceptor, and doped with phosphorus, creating n-type material, a donor. These p- and n-type materials are sandwiched together, creating a p-n junction, much like a semiconductor in your mobile phone or computer. The free electrons in the n-type material cross the junction and fill the holes in the p-type material, forming an electrostatic field across the junction. As the sun's rays shine on the junction, photons dislodge electrons within the electrostatic field. The electrostatic field propels the dislodged electrons out of the junction, creating a DC current flow. This DC current is sent to a device called an inverter, which uses semiconductors as switches to vary the direction of current flow, changing direct current electricity into alternating current as found on our power grid. Other than size, the PV systems found on rooftops of homes are no different than those found on large utility scale systems, commonly referred to as solar farms. Here we see a graph showing the average daily demand seen by the power grid. If we superimpose the sun's potential energy on this graph, we notice that these PV systems are putting energy onto the grid 
at a time when the demand is at its lowest. Energy storage allows us to store the energy produced by these PV systems during the day and dispatch that energy at times of peak demand, such as early morning or late in the evening. Despite the current state of storage, in 2014, California became the first state to generate more than 5% of its electricity from solar energy. Four years later, in 2018, North Carolina joined the club. These two states currently lead the U.S. in installed capacity and are leading the way to a greener future.